Before we start the session, let me introduce a stellar panel that we have with us today. A plethora of views coming through and my lovely co-host Nandini Bhalla. We have with us Rohit Kamath, founder India Hemp Organics. Also, Lavina Sirohi, founder India Hemp Organics. Shrijan Sharma, founder and CEO It's Hemp. Jirak Tek Changdani, co-founder and CEO Bombay Hemp Company, Obohiko. Now, if you've been at any pharmacy or any stall in one of the bigger cities in India, you've started seeing these products. But do you know what really goes in making these products? What's the process like? More importantly, I think we need to do a lot more myth-busting now, Nandini. What do you say? Over to you. All right. Hi, guys. You know, um, just so everybody knows here, uh, hemp is being called the ultimate super crop. It is being called the, the million dollar crop, trillion dollar crop, is that so? And the billion dollar crop. And when you actually go back to the old Vedic texts, it was actually hailed as one of the five sacred plants. Cannabis was hailed one of the five sacred plants. Um, you can actually use hemp now to make over 25,000 products. And I have a very, very small list here, but you can use hemp to actually make hemp oil, hemp jeans, hemp flour, hemp shoes, bags, cookies, cakes, uh, toilet paper, you just name it, 25,000 things can be made using hemp. And yet, and yet, when you go and actually Google hemp, one of the first things that comes up is, will it make me high? Will hemp make me high? If I eat a hemp cookie, will I be high? If I wear a hemp fiber t-shirt, will it make me high? Which is why for my very first thing to ask is, honestly, hand on heart, does hemp make people high? And I think I'm going to start maybe right at the end. And then after you are done, because I already know what your answer is going to be, I would also love to know a little bit about some of these strange things that all of you get asked about hemp. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Nandini, Ayush, uh, firstly, for having us here. It's a pleasure. Um, and good afternoon to one and all. I think um, it's been about almost uh, the better part of a decade that I've uh, been answering some of these questions about will hemp get me high. So um, just for everyone to know, uh, we're talking about and addressing something uh, which is pretty much a taboo in this country. It's uh, uh, called cannabis. Uh, but this plant has two species. One of them is hemp, whereas the other is marijuana. Now, the fundamental difference between these two is a compound in the plant called THC. THC is the euphoric high uh, compound that gets, gets everyone intoxicated. Um, and hemp, specifically, the species of hemp, has reputedly under 0.3% THC. So when uh, a plant has under 0.3% THC, whether it's used for wellness, nutrition, you make cookies out of it, coffee out of it, um, you, can, you can wear clothes out of it, uh, all of that is absolutely legitimate and it's never going to give you that high that you're looking for or not, right? So uh, from, um, from a nutrition point of view, it's known as a superfood. Uh, in the health and wellness aspects, there are many, many, many uh, uses that uh, people have actually worked with uh, on cannabis, and um, that's what we're here to tell you a little more about today. And just like Nandini was saying, the minute you Google a word like that, the algorithm springs up all sorts of strange responses. Let's speak to Google about that, but Srijan, I know that you're, you've got this very popular introduction where you say, I sell t-shirts made of bhang. Yeah. Because there's a taboo associated with that word, right? And I think with the entire industry, there's a lot of, like I said, myths that need to be busted. The entire hemp industry that largely is on this stage, a big chunk of it, what's the issue that you guys face? Is it genuinely a case of bad marketing and branding? Uh, so in a way, yes, it is a case of bad marketing and branding. I'm sorry, guys, Srijan here from It's Hemp. And thank you for having me here. <laughs> so let's get back to the question. Uh, so this is, this is something that I have said many, many, many times before as well, that 
uh, cannabis is a case of bad marketing. It is the most popular plant on the planet, and yet it is the most controversial plant as well. Some people talk about it as a plant which will get you high. Others talk about it as medicines or food or clothing or whatever. In India, we popularly call it bhang. So that that is where the statement that I often say that I sell bhang for a living comes from. And see, at the end of the day, it is a plant, right? You can call it magical. You can call it a, a drug or whatever. It depends on the use case and the people who are actually using the plant. We on this panel today are trying to create something from this plant that not a lot of people are interested in as a commercial activity, and we're trying to change that. So bringing a greener, healthier plan, uh, you know, b building a healthier planet with cannabis is, is the dream that we all are focused towards. So yeah, I mean, if we get good, good marketing, then it will go from being the taboo plant to the wonder plant real soon. Hello. Yeah. And if I could add to that, I think it's um, the responsibility is on us as an industry. You know, uh, we form uh, the social movement for medical cannabis or just cannabis as a plant in general. And we have to collectively drive forward that education. So yes, while the taboo in the country exists, we have to uh, we have to be well aware that this plant holds a long historical and cultural connection with us. And now we've been so we've been a witness of so many so many cases where patients are well benefiting from it. So are we really going to recognize this one plant for the single use of recreational purposes, or are we going to look at it for its 25,000 plus other uses where it can be, uh, you know, it can really help right from our consumers to our patients to our farmers to our government and an economy as a whole. Great. You know, I'll just quickly um, ask one more thing, which is a little bit of a first basis to all of this. And perhaps super duper quickly, Rohit, you know, you, you, can, you can just tell everyone. Um, I, I just think that people tend to be a little bit scared about the fact that you can get hemp and you can get cannabis or you can get basically um, weed, marijuana, what you smoke for, like other reasons from the same plant. How do you, or how does the government, or how do people who like basically make it, how do you basically move away, separate those parts of it, which would make it safe to actually eat a cookie made from hemp and not do what it would do as a different part of that plant? But just super duper quickly, because then I have my next question to ask you. That good question, right? So now here, if you have been look at it, it's like looking at a cat family, right? You have a household cat, you have a lion, you have a tiger, you have a leopard, right? All of these like are different species. Now similarly in hemp, you only have one compound out of the thousand plus compounds found in the plant which makes you high, which is I mean THC, right? So up isolating that like one compound, you have nothing else in the plant that is intoxicating of any nature. In fact, hemp can get you really, really high on nutrition. Nothing else, right? If you if you isolate THC and remove it, so it's about I mean creating the right I mean legislation, the right rules to grow the plant in a way which is like prescribed by the government, right? And not just growing it for I mean THC purposes or for I mean recreational purposes, which is very possible with with the advancements in science that we have today. Right? Got it. Okay, so. I just read this great uh, piece of like, sort of information which asked, can hemp change the world? Now that's a rather massive claim. Can hemp change the world? Now, hemp, uh, and they're saying that hemp could actually take over basically plastic, right? Because hemp could be used to ultimately replace our everyday plastic use. Hemp could be used for feeds for your cattle. And as all of us know, India is like sort of one of the largest consumers as well as sort of exporters of milk. So we need feed for the cattle. Um, hemp is also being said that it could actually tack it, you know, it that it could actually um, try and fix basically climate change. Massive, massive, massive claims, okay? And I want you all to please tell me honestly, how much truth is there in these claims, because if this is true, we could be on the brink of an absolutely phenomenal change in the world. So once again, I'm going to start right from you. Super. Um, <clears throat> I think it's important to uh, put this down this way, 
there are five parts of this plant that we're talking about. Um, one is a seed, one is a fiber, one is the leaf, uh, one is the bud, which is the cannabis flower, and then there is a resin from the flower. NDPS Act in India clearly demarcates the fact that seed, fiber, and the leaf are all exempt from the bracketing as a narcotic. So they are all permitted to be used. Now, growing hemp is a 90 to 120 day process. It is, um, all of India is already got a weed crop like hemp growing in its backyard. So the farmer doesn't have to do much. We are already, it's, it's one of the most underutilized yet abundantly available fiber and seed in India at the moment. So it grows in 90 to 120 days. It grows 12 feet tall. At least hemp grows 12 feet tall. Um, and it has 25,000 proven applications. To address the point that you raised, one of the best properties that hemp has is that it has, it actually fixes the soil. So when one wants to grow the plant in this country, they can grow it even in alteration. They don't have to grow it as a mainstay. And, and when they do that, for their next cycle of growing, it actually remediates the soil and makes it much more fertile to grow the next uh, uh, you know, season on. So I think that is probably one of the best. And also, uh, just um, typically, it, it uh, consumes a lot of it. It soaks in a lot of carbon dioxide. So it's uh, really good for the planet in general. Thank you. One last thing before I move on to you. Sorry, tell me about basically plastic. And I think that that can be a real game changer. Would you like to tell me any of you about the plastic part of how hemp could take over plastic use? So yeah, so see hemp as a fiber or as a, uh, as a fiber is one of the longest fibers that is available on the planet. That is naturally occurring. There are only, a, I think a couple more stronger and longer fibers that are available. <coughs> The issue with the plastic industry right now is that we rely so much on petroleum for our use for, uh, you know, manufacturing of plastic that it is unsustainable and it does not really go away very quickly. Even if you decompose plastic, you still have the threat of microplastics and what not uh, filling up the environment. So when we manufacture the same pl uh, plastic with hemp, and the process is simple as any other bioplastic, right? But the point being, it is a stronger plastic that you create. It has less micro uh, microplastics that go out into the environment and continue pol polluting. It is abundantly available, so you don't have to dig through the Earth's resources to keep manufacturing it. A 120-day growth cycle, in a way, ensures that you have at least four cycles from the same, you know, patch of land. So that means you, you can at least have four times more plastic uh, manufactured compared to whatever you are actually doing. And another important thing that is linked to plastic is also the use of uh, hemp as paper alternative. So instead of cutting down trees uh, to create timber paper, you can actually grow a lot more cannabis and use that fiber to create a lot more paper as well. So Just to add, add there, right, like a tree takes about 20 to 25 years to grow and you chop that tree to make paper, right? The U.S., I mean, the, the, the entire, I mean, U.S. like declaration of like endopet, like was, I mean, written on hemp paper, right? And a hemp takes about four months to grow. So, <clears throat> you know, Chirag, I, you did mention the, the legalities of this because I need to, in a previous life, I was a lawyer. I want to ask a couple of legal questions, but before I do, for our audience, um, I don't want to get too jargonistic in this whole process. So you're talking about products, right? It's, it's a plethora of products. You're talking about animal husbandry, grooming, medicine, construction, automobiles, apparel. If someone is coming to join this industry, maybe join this panel next time around where, when we're talking, what's the most profitable? You mentioned ecologically feasible. What's the most profitable uh, section of this industry, Chirag, to really get into? Right. Um, thank you. Thank you for getting to uh, the commercial aspect of this. Uh, overseas and across the globe, uh, the highest amount of value one has found from the crop has been from the medical and wellness-related applications of this. The globe has made more than a billion dollars when this crop was actually or belonged first to the Himalayas, which we share a part of as well. 
The world has, has harnessed this particular crop and made more than a billion dollar industry primarily in the medical and recreational spaces. Um, over, the, the, over the years, what we have done in India to bring about that uh, or, or walk that curve a certain way is that obviously when we started off, the lowest hanging fruit was to popularize hemp as a fiber and build out the textile value chain because India innately is a textile economy. Once we were able to do that, and thanks to Min Ministry of Ayush, which is uh, the presence of Ayurveda, Ayurveda actually uh, spiritually, culturally, and historically identifies what's known as bhang, which is the leaf of the cannabis plant, for 5,000 plus years. So one can, and, and Ayurveda is not a reductionist science, so it's not the allopathic route, but it's a holistic science, which means what they do is they say, you can use the leaf of the plant in its entirety and make medicines of it. So whether it's um, the whole pain segment, arthritis, we've got sleep, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, insomnia related disorders, all can be cured with uh, uh, the presence of uh, a hemp based leaf product. I'd Shri like to add in a little bit. So let's leave the global scale aside for a bit. Uh, just consider India as a country. There are over 400 million menstruating women. There are over 200 million chronic pain patients. There are over 100 million high stress employees. All of these people and add, add to it the fact that India is one of the most depressed countries in the world right now with one in five people suffering from depression or anxiety or some sort of a mental disorder. Having a natural alternative, a natural uh, you know, solution to lifestyle disorders is paramount for any individual. And cannabis, as of right now, with Ayurveda, gives us that opportunity to create that space where people can work on their mental problems and realize that, okay, this is, this is something that is a legitimate natural solution. Instead of relying heavily on opioids or you know, any, any sort of drugs in, in whatever manner. Getting a natural, non-addictive uh, solution to a lifestyle disorder is a major, major gameplay, both commercially and as, as a humane thing to do as well. In terms of legal acceptance, I think there's a lot of, a lot of interesting, and I, want to, I wanted you to weigh in on it as well, Lavina. Yeah. Around the world, different jurisdictions, different countries look at this differently, even in India. We have certain states that view this very differently. I'm guessing there's a lot of historic and cultural significance there as well. Um, but when we look at what's happening maybe in China across the border, right, it's a very different story. Not too far away, but a very different view on this. In terms of a regulatory and a legal acceptance sort of a view, when we're talking about India, how can we make this more acceptable and ubiquitous? So if you look at the law that's present in the country today, um, Cannabis is governed by the NDPS Act of 1985. India is actually one of the most federally legal countries in the entire world. So every state has an autonomy to make um, you know, its own decision when it comes to governing the use, the transport, consumption, and possession of, medical, of cannabis um, as a plant. I believe in terms of the law that's already present, I think uh, when it comes to the act in itself, it's already fairly, fairly strict. And uh, I think uh, you know we need to move away from um, while we all, while we have a fairly liberal law. I think we need to move away from the. If you look at the United uh, United States, and if you look at the U.S. diplomats that had made us implement this fairly strict, uh, which is one of the most uh, one of the most uh, uh, the strictest. Uh, policies in place in the country, the conversation even overseas has shifted away from, you know, criminalizing consumptions in small amounts, um, away from criminalizing it and towards like making it a conversation around public health. If you look at the White House, uh, right, per se, they're moving, the national conversation has moved away from criminal, criminal law around cannabis to 
advocating for it for public health. Same way, I believe, in India as well, we need to have, a, you know, a, there is a misconception that if we have a strict criminal law, that will fairly hold us back from uh, consumption. We need to acknowledge the fact that there are going to be people that are going to be, fail, um, you know, experimenting with it or consuming it in small amounts. But the conversation has to move away from, uh, it's not so much about the law and order anymore, while yes, it is governed by it, but it is more so about the well-being of our people. And I feel like today we have a moral obligation to put that into, to put that into consideration because, um, Irrespective of, irrespective of, uh, you know, people consuming it or not, I think um, the law needs to, um, as a, sorry, I'm just uh, going to take a second to collect my thoughts. But what I'm trying to say is because it's, um, we need to focus more on the welfare of our Absolutely. people, and uh, you know, that's that's uh, where we need to. Move no, I'm, I'm going to be handing it over to Nandini now. But before I do, just so that the audience gets a little bit more of an anecdotal sort of. Um, uh, an experience of what you guys go through on a daily basis. We live in India, multicultural, fascinating country that we live in. But Chirag, I'm guessing, you're based out of here in Mumbai. When the authorities or any, anyone from government offices have to deal with you, I'm guessing there must be some anecdotes where there's some interesting conversations to be had. Yeah, of course. So there's, there's the government and then there's consumers, right? So uh, a, a, a few fun stories when we first started. Um, we, we used to take part at these uh, flea markets, exhibitions and conferences where we say exhibit our products. Uh, we started in 2013 as a company and the first time we exhibited um, hemp clothing or apparel and accessories, we found a lot of, a large amount of audiences walk into our uh, stores and actually start smelling the fabric, right? So they wanted to understand if it actually resonates with the smell of bhang, uh, which is what we call it, bhang ke kapri, right? Um, and over the course, uh, I think one of the first uh, meetings we had was on the 7th of Feb 2014. Uh, I distinctly remember it was at the North Block uh, Department of uh, Revenue Ministry of Finance. And uh, we were asked to come in and give them a, an entire um, lay down or, or low down rather on what the world has done with this f uh, crop. And uh, to, to our surprise, a lot of the officials uh, that belong to several parts of this country that were invited for that knew a lot of what we were already presenting. Um, everybody knew. All, obviously, we had to take a salad, we had to take a brick, and we had to take this T-shirt to show them roti, kapra, makan, all out of one crop, which is known as cannabis or bhang in this country. But when that happened, they were all pretty amazed uh, and very reciprocative to what we were asking for. Right? And, and uh, a large part of the central government already points to the direction that state has the powers as she, uh, as Lavina just uh, alluded to. And uh, I think that makes it very conducive for a very thriving and flourishing economy for cannabis in the country. Fabulous, and I love that line about roti, kapra, makan, all from cannabis. We okay, we have all only or the wine. The wine, and also, and also that. We are down to our last, question, um, which will really be about where from here. Currently, China is the world's number one hemp, basically, producer, correct? And do you think that in the next five years, of course, we just talked about basically legal issues, we just talked about all, all kinds of basically government changes, which, you know, must be looked into, but since you're all experts and since somebody actually just called them the Mal High Club, that was a very, very cute name to be giving, but do you see in the next five years, ten years, can basically India look at getting to that level, being taking that spot, number one spot, super quickly, each of you, 30, 30 seconds about what it will take to make that change, and can it actually happen? So I'll go ahead, right? So I mean, if you, I mean, look at the entire like, global market, it's a 40 plus billion dollar market, right? And before, and before the entire like, NDPS Act, India was actually one of the global leaders in this space. Even the word Indica originates from the word India, right? Uh, it's like a very I mean, interesting fact there. And if you see, India only occupies a 0.00001% of that global market, which is nothing, 
though india has a great competitive advantage we have a great climate we have good soil we have uh, uh, so like we have a a great i mean labor force so india so here i'm i'm, I'm not seeing the I mean, vision of india just like participating in the industry but here we are i mean looking at like, at like a vision and the way that we should i mean make our legislation and law is to make india a global leader in this space not just participate in the industry right i mean just like our neighbors like in china they are i mean dominating this i mean market right now mm. Thank you. And to further add to that, you know, 58% we're a land of um, traditional medicine, and 58% of our livelihood depends on the agricultural economy. Hemp as a crop is can really, really be a great solution for our farmers' livelihood. And you know, you have increasing, you have increasing uh, suicide rates because, of, and you have uh, cases where farmers are relocating from one state to another because of you know a better standard of living. Whereas hemp can well challenge, let's say, the monopoly of even cotton. And I think uh, not just for the farmers alone, but uh, since they form such a large uh, part of our ecosystem, right from our farmers to our consumers, as well as the patients that are well benefiting from its Thank medical you. uses, all the way to our government and the economy as a whole, I think hemp can really be the billion dollar all crop right, that I it is. I have a little time up, flashing board, so super duper quickly. So we're, we're living uh, in a journey of cannabis in this country where educate, cultivate, elevate is the most important aspect that the, uh, the country needs. Uh, we've already come far enough to cultivate cannabis. We just recently grew 0.3% THC plants in Uttarakhand, which is one of the biggest achievements the country saw. Uh, now it's time to elevate, elevate everyone who belongs to the industry, to uh, all the Indian consumers. We want to live in a world, and in five years from today, we will see that. Uh, we want to live in, a, in an India where arthritis, uh, brain cancer, uh, insomnia-related disorders, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's are all being cured by our uh, own plant in the backyard known as Bhang, and data and clinical trials are being conducted to make sure that happens. India being one of the largest consumer markets in the world obviously is a set stage for a crop like cannabis which is indigenous to the country which has a lot of use cases within the country itself even if you don't have to go outside even if we exclude exports for a while within the country we have this potential to create a billion dollar market and considering that Himalayas is, is one of the key words in our industry so to say. Uh, the export market and people who are interested in investing in an industry to grow in India is huge outside India as well. So in five years, I see there is a strong possibility that India can be one of the world leaders in cannabis and hemp industry. Fascinating insights. I think that's about all the time we have. You said educate, elevate. Um, we've been entertained over the time as well. Yes. And of course, elevated. And we're all a lot more educated when we're talking about the future of hemp, the future of bhang. That's not a taboo anymore. We can say that after this panel. And thank you so much for being such a lovely panel. Thank you, Nandini, for being such a lovely co-host. And thank you for being such a fascinating audience. Thanks so much, guys.